morning. Is this on? Okay. The, uh, the Duenas family had escaped the winter sicknesses until yesterday, so uh, they all drop like flies, so I'll probably be horizontal somewhere by about Tuesday. Uh, hopefully not. I've managed to escape it thus far, but we'll see. Uh, I'm glad to be here with you this morning, and uh, let me pray to start us, and then we'll dive into it here. Father, we want to ask that you would glorify your name in our hearts. You would help us to have a true picture of the good and happy future that you offer in the gospel, and that we would bank on you, Lord Jesus, for that future. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I want to try something a little different here today. Um, And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through what I'm going to say, but then at the end, I'll open it up for Q&A. So that doesn't mean you have to ask questions, but if you have questions, I've enlisted uh, Eli Feather to be my little microphone guy, and he'll bring the microphone to you, and you can ask me about whatever you want. Preferably related to what I've said, but you can can fire away at anything you want. So I'll I'll leave some time for that at the end. Um, But we've been talking, uh, Casey's been preaching through Romans, and so the last couple chapters in Romans, Paul has been saying a lot about faith, and what faith is, and how we're justified by faith, and we're uh, reckoned to be right with God, righteous uh, through faith, and so I wanted to do a little extended kind of meditation on that. Casey had talked about Hebrews 11 a little bit, uh, I think a couple sermons ago, And so I'm just going to go into it a little bit more. I'm sure there's a chapter that most of you are familiar with. Um, Hebrews 11 really is kind of a meditation or reflection on faith. What is faith? What does it look like? And so I'm going to talk about that um, here this morning. And I I wanted to just dive into what I think is the controlling thematic verse within Hebrews 11. And I'll talk a little more about examples in that chapter, but verse 6 really is... The, the verse that controls everything that's said in that chapter. And there the author says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. For anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. It, it's an astounding text if you really stop and meditate on it and reflect on it that he's saying if you come to God, you have to come to him not just trusting that he's there, but believing that he will reward you if you seek him. You can't just come to him for knowledge or to, to, to do any old thing. You have to really bank on him for the good and happy future that he promises. And everyone wants a good and happy future. This is my first time with the PowerPoint here too, so I'll just assume that that will change with me as I... But, but the, everyone wants the good and happy future. There's a quote by the mathematician Blaise Pascal. Some of you may have heard it before. He says, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. That's true. We, we often say, well, people who commit suicide, they, they've done that because they just hate life, whatever. Well, they may hate their situation, but they still think at the end of it, there's something better for them. We always are moving in a way, even if we don't consciously recognize it, towards something that we think is better. There's some good and happy future that we want. Maybe it's the next heroin fix. Maybe it's just wanting to have a nice, comfortable life somewhere in the suburbs. It could be anything, the whole range. Uh, We hang on to our fears and hurts and anxieties. I mean, oftentimes we hold on to them with a death grip. We've got hurts that are buried there, maybe from childhood. And we we know they're there, but we go, I'm not going to let go of that. Or we have an anger or a bitterness towards somebody. We say, I'm not, I just can't give it up. I mean, if I were to forgive that person, what would happen to me, right? If I give up control, if I, if I stop obsessing or worrying about my finances and, and what kind of financial situation I'm in, if I, if I don't do that, who's going to do it for me? Won't I just 
end up bankrupt? I mean, something could really go bad. And so we hold on to it because we believe that we'll be undone if we let go. And we, that's because we have a, a wrong idea of the good and happy future. We imagine some doomsday scenario um, that's going to happen to us. And so we need to move, maneuver and control things so that we can bring about the future that we think will be best. We see a bad example of this right in the book of Hebrews. Uh, In the next chapter, the author talks about Esau. Says, Esau had a conception, at least in the moment, of what he thought would be best when he came in from hunting game and he was famished, he was starving. And Jacob meets him at the door and he says to, uh, Esau says to him, well, give me some of that stew. And Jacob says, well, I will if you give me your birthright. That seems like kind of a bogus trade-off, right? But Esau didn't care. Esau didn't have the thought of the good and happy future of getting the blessing from Isaac and inheriting his birthright. He said, I just want the bowl of soup. So sure, you can have it. And so then he, that happens, and then when he doesn't get the blessing, the author of Hebrews says, he sought for it with tears, but he was denied. He couldn't get the blessing. So He had an idea of what he thought would be best for him to trade his birthright for a bowl of soup, but that didn't work out very well. He had a bad idea of the good and happy future. And all of us, to one degree or another, have a wrong idea of the good and happy future. If if we perfectly trusted God for the future that he offers in the gospel, then we would have no trouble doing what he says. We would know with that confidence, this is the future that God has promised, and it's the best one. No matter what suffering I have to go through now. So I think that's the first point. The second point is, is up there, we're all banking on someone or something to bring us this good and happy future. We have the good and happy future in our mind, and we are banking on some, everyone is. We may be banking on ourselves and our own cleverness or ingenuity. We may be banking on family or friends. We may be banking on the government, winning the lottery some God of our own conception, but we are banking on someone or something to come through for us that's going to bring the good and happy future. And Hebrews 11.6 says that we have to bank on God for the good and happy future. We must come to him, and this is the key part, we must come to him explicitly seeking the reward that he gives. Otherwise, we can't please God. If we come to God thinking, God, I just want to do something for you. We won't please him. We have to come to him expecting him to do something for us. And you see that, uh, I didn't put the scripture in here, but in Isaiah 64, 4, there's a scripture that says, there's no one has ever seen or heard with their ear, seen with their eye, a God besides you who works for those who wait for him. We're not working for God. God is working for us. Now, that sounds kind of backwards, really. God, is he my servant? God is working for us. Okay, I'll say more about that. But we have to come to him believing that, too, that he will work for us for the good and happy future that's promised in the gospel. We have to do that if we want to please him. And we see this truth throughout the scripture. Okay, so this is not something that's just in the book of Hebrews. It's all throughout the scripture. So I want to just give a few scriptures that would illustrate this. And there's hundreds more. And I think if you, if you have this thought, Hebrews 6, 11, 6 in your mind is sort of the paradigm or the, the theme throughout the scripture, you'll start to see this everywhere. The first one I have is Genesis 15, 1, and I'll run through these fairly quickly. You don't have to flip to all of them. I think I've got them up here. Do not fear, God says to Abraham, do not fear. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Deuteronomy 5.33, God is talking to the Israelites, and he says, You shall walk in all the way which the Lord your God has commanded you. Why? That you may live long. You may live, and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you will possess. You obey me, and this is what I will do for you. It will go well with you. You'll live long. You'll prolong your days. By the way, children, uh, You know, when it says to obey your father and mother, there's a reward. In fact, Paul says in Ephesians, it's the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you. I say that to my kids. I don't think they think that. But I said, if you want it to go well with you, you should obey. 
That's what God says. I mean, I, I try not to make it sound like it's self-serving. I said, look, I didn't say that. God says it. But if you believe it, then you should do it. It's the first commandment with a promise. All right. Back to these. Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. That's what God said to Joshua. Let my words be in your mouth, in your mind, your heart. Do them. Be careful to do them. Because the reward is prosperity and success. God commands, the next scripture, uh, Psalm 19. Uh, we know this one, right? This is the heavens are telling the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. But the second half of this psalm talks a lot about God's law. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, uh, making wise the simple. And he goes on and on. And so he says that God's commands, his statutes, his precepts and ordinances are more desirable than gold. Yes, than much pure gold. Sweeter also are they than honey, than honey from the comb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Just let that sink in. In keeping them, there is great reward. Do you believe that? In keeping God's commands, there's great reward. We have an example here in Psalm 81. I, this one just struck me anew. I, I knew verse 16 and verse 11, but I, and when I read it again, I thought, wow, this is God's plea to, to Israel. He says, hear, O my people, and I will admonish you. Oh, Israel, if you would listen to me, you can hear God. Like it says in Romans, all day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Listen to me, Israel, if you would, but listen to me. Don't let there be a strange God among you. There shall, you shall not worship any foreign God. Put away the idols. I, the Lord, am your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. That's something God did in the past. We know he can be trusted. I brought you up. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice and Israel did not obey me. So I gave them over to the stubbornness of their heart to walk in their own devices. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways, that God is pleading with them. Why? I would quickly subdue their enemies. Look what I would do for them if they would listen to me. I would subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. Those who hate the Lord would pretend obedience to him. And their time of punishment would be forever. But I would feed you, Israel, with the finest of the wheat. And with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Listen to me, is what God says. Obey me. I would feed you. Open your mouth wide. I would fill it. There's nothing I wouldn't do for you to bring you the life that I offer you. Jesus picks up the same theme. This is in uh, Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. He said, whatever that treasure is, he says, the treasure in the field is so great that the man would give everything he has to get that treasure in the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, of course, the point of that is that God is the treasure. Not, not the things that God can give, but he's trying to illustrate that point. Jesus is the treasure for which we ought to give everything and do it joyfully. The, you, you see in that scripture, he says, right, from joy over it, from joy over it, he goes and sells. He's not like, man, do I have to give up everything? No, the treasure he sees is so astounding. He's overjoyed to give up everything he has to go buy that field. Paul says the same thing, Philippians 3. I think Casey's mentioned this one before. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Do you see the comparison there? It's the pursuit of something better. 
Yes, I'm giving up something, but God is so much better. Christ is so much better. I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Do you see here, Paul has the good and happy future in mind. He goes on to say, I'm running to get the prize. I haven't obtained it yet, but I want to have it. It's all future looking. Faith is all, we look back at what God has done for us in the cross and in Jesus' resurrection, and we, then we look forward and say, Man, I'm banking on you, Jesus, to give it to me. I want the resurrection. I want to know the power of God. I want to know his fellowship, Paul says. It's so much better than what I had before. Whatever I had before is like a stinking pile of turd. Right? I mean, that's what he's saying. Uh, it's, and that's the way we ought to think about it. What God has on offer is unimaginably better than the baubles and the trinkets that we hold on to that seems so important to us. We have to be reminded again and again. I, there's no other way. It's the reward that motivates the faith of the saints. We see this in Hebrews 11. So let's look at the, the folks, some of the folks in Hebrews 11. I don't know if I, I put these up. Maybe I did. But Noah, in this, Hebrews 11 now goes through all the, these people that you know, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and it talks about how they banked on God for the good and happy future. Noah banked on God and built an ark for the salvation of his household, and he became an heir of righteousness, it says. Abraham banked on God. He went out from his home, it says there, when God called him because he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. He desired a better country, that is, a heavenly one. So Abraham said, well, yeah, you're calling me away from my home. This is everything I know. This is where my family is. And you're telling me to go to some place I don't know. I don't even know where I'm going. But God, whatever it is you're offering me it has to be better. So I'll follow you there. He was looking ahead to a city who, that has foundations, it says. Moses, same way. Moses had the riches of Egypt. He was a daughter. He was a son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was there in Pharaoh's house. He had access to all of this, the learning, the, the food, the everything, the life. But it says, he chose to endure ill treatment with the people of God than, rather than enjoying the pleasures of sin for a time. He considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. He's specifically looking to the reward. He's not looking back. He's looking forward. He looks back only to see what God has already done. And then he looks and says, you'll do the same thing if I trust you for the future, tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Rahab. Rahab, same way. She did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. She knew Boy, it sure will be better since I've heard about God and I know what's going to happen here. It'd be better for me to trust God and to hide these spies because when they come in here and conquer the land, which they surely will because God is on their side, uh, I want to be with them. And so she was. It, the, the chapter finishes out by saying that women receive back their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured not accepting their release. That's crazy, right? You can get free. No, I won't. Uh, that's all right. I'll stay in prison. Not accepting their release. Why? Some crazy idea? No. So that they might obtain a better resurrection. They looked to the good and happy future. They said, prison now, 
Better resurrection? Yeah, that's what I want. That's what God's offering. They entered into suffering. So even suffering, even suffering is something that God says these people entered into willingly. They, they were tortured. One, one person says they were sawed in half. Just try to think about that, being sawed in half. They don't put you under for that either. Uh, but these people were banking on God. They wanted God. They wanted the future that God offers. Now, this all might sound, you know, theoretical, and, and we look at these people. I mean, th- these are examples of real people who did it. Abraham's a real person. Moses is a real person. They banked on God, and they, re- they, they entered into that good and happy future, although even at the end of that chapter says they didn't get all that was promised. It, it had to wait until the time of Christ and us receiving it with them. But they were banking on God. But here's where this gets down to the nitty-gritty, okay? It's Hebrews, the author is not just trying to say, well, faith, this is what faith looks like, and isn't that a nice thing to go home with? No, he's saying, this is what you want to do too. So when you get into the next couple of chapters, he talks about some of these specific areas. So one of them is, if you look at Hebrews 13, and this is a big one, this is a huge one. Financial security. Now, you know this scripture. He says, keep yourselves free from the love of money and be content with what you have. That's, that's a pretty tall order sometimes, right? Keep yourselves free from, especially in America, keep yourselves free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Now, I should say, sometimes people hear being content with what you have and they say, well, are you saying I should just not think about my finances? You should have budgets, you should plan, you should be wise. There's plenty in the scripture that talks about being wise with your money and not being foolish. And we, we ought to uh, think about how we can use money in ways that will honor God and be good stewards of it. Sure, we, we don't just throw caution to the wind or uh, act foolishly. But the point here, the, the key word is the word to be content. Contentment. Can you be content? He says, can you keep yourself free from love money and be content with what you have? If you're somebody who's on eating just rice and beans because you don't have much money, can you be content with that? Uh, if you have a lot, can you be content with that? Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 8, something crazy. Just to Americans, this is crazy. If we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. We would. We would be content if we just had food and clothing. I don't think so. Not many of us. Uh, I, I'm not. But that's what Paul says. So there should be no headlong pursuit of continually moving up. We need, oh, I've got to move up. What is the next thing I've got to move up to? No, he says, why does, what's the motivation here? Don't submit to the love of money. Be content with what you have. Because God has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So we may say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Now, he could do a lot of things to you. He could kill you. He could take your money. I mean, man could come along and take your money, and you can be bankrupted. Uh, I had a friend who I knew back in California. He had a business. He and his wife had a business. They went into business with this partner They thought they trusted the partner. I mean, you know where this is going. They had a partner. The partner behind the scenes was working all the legal angles and whatever to take the business from them. And then one day they showed up to their, what they thought was their business still, and they were locked out. They couldn't get in. He had taken the business. It wasn't theirs anymore. People can take a lot from you. Man can do a lot to you. But God says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So even if you are just eating rice and beans, even if your house is only 800 square feet, even if you haven't bought new clothes in years, whatever the case may be, you can be content with that. You don't need to worry about the future. You can plan for the future. You should, but you don't have to worry about it. You can be content where you are right now. And God wants you to be. This is a command. It's not a suggestion. I think that's a big one. Uh, probably you'd agree. I know in marriages, it's a huge deal. Husbands and wives, back, what are we doing with the money? Okay. We need to trust God with it because God will never fail us. He'll never forsake us. Daily work. 
That's the Most of you work. I work. If you don't work in a workplace, uh, you may work at home. That's work. Uh, there's a lot of work that we do. And Paul says in Colossians 3, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Work hard. Do well. Be excellent. Put in discretionary effort. Work at it with all your heart. Not some of your heart. Not three quarters of your heart. The whole thing. From your soul, work at it. I don't care if you think your job is a deadbeat job. You're just digging ditches and then filling them up again. Whatever it is, he says, work at it with all your heart. Why? What's the motivation there? Knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as a reward. That's true. That's the motivation. You go to work every day and you think it's a dead-end job. It may be. And it's, Paul's not saying never change jobs, never seek any better situation. But whatever it is that you have that day in front of you to do for work, do it with all your heart because you know the good and happy future. You will receive an inheritance as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you're serving. I'm not serving the attorney general. I mean, I am. I work for him. But I'm serving the Lord Christ. He's my master. I do my work for him. He's the one who will reward me. That's important. You know, uh, Christians used to be known as the hardest workers. People wanted to hire Christians because they worked the hardest. And you never had to watch them because they had integrity, and you didn't have to worry if they were stealing the pencils or whatever, you know. I mean, I don't know if that's true anymore. should be true. We have an inheritance as a reward from the Lord. Okay, last one, not getting even with others. Don't get even with others. Maybe this is not your thing right now, but for most of us at some point it may be. You get, you get, you're angry at somebody or somebody's wronged you. Maybe they've wronged you in a big way. Maybe it's just small, but Paul... I mean, I have to deal with my, my kids all the time. Again, this is a, you know, kind of a tough lesson. Well, my brother's going to get away with it. Man, he, he always gets away with it. You, you don't do anything to him. So I need to take care of it. One of my sons is really, he likes rough justice. I try to say, you know, he actually, he's pretty sharp. He, he looks at this one and he says, I tell him this scripture where God says, don't repay anyone evil for evil. Don't repay your brother evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in your own eyes. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge. Tell them. Why? Because you should leave room for the wrath of God. And his response to me sometimes is, yeah, but he's a Christian. He's, God's not going to inflict wrath on him. So then I have to explain it to him in a little more detail. You know, but the, yeah, that's okay. There's an answer to that. But uh, here, Paul is simply saying, look, get yourself out of the revenge business. Well, hey, you're not very good at it. You might think you are, but you're not. Uh, God's much better at it. And frankly, it doesn't satisfy. It's, just, it's, it's not the good and happy future that people know. You can talk to people who have actually gotten revenge. Generally speaking, and I go, yeah, yeah, that was it. I mean, that was the end all be all. It was everything I hoped for. It never is. So God says, leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. He's in the revenge business. If you don't think God's in the revenge business, you're wrong. He's in it. Right? That's the God he is. Don't, don't make him not a revenge, vengeful God. He is one. He said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Leave room for the wrath of God. It's there. It will come on those who don't believe. God is a wrathful God. He will take care of it. And if they're a believer, he has taken care of it at great cost to him. If he's, but so he says, but you don't have to be in that business. So if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You can't do that unless you are banking on God for the good and happy future. Unless you believe that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. If you don't think that, you can't overcome evil with good. You just won't. So those are just three examples. Again, there's... Examples for every, there's this, this is the pattern in every area of life. Forgiveness, okay, 
uh, not worrying, getting rid of your anxiety, all of it is motivated by the desire and the, the promise of something better that God has on offer. So I, I suggest you meditate on that. I encourage you, meditate on your, the, what you, if you and uh, your spouse or just you yourself worry a lot about money or you fight over it or whatever, this is something for you to think about, right? I mean, what if I don't do that? Can I be content with what I have that God will take care of me? My work, am I giving my best effort because I know that I'm receiving an inheritance from the Lord? Can I let go of my desire to get revenge? Now, this, this can't happen just on your own by thinking about it for a few minutes. This has to be a, something that we as a community encourage each other in constantly. God has something better for you. God wants you to come to him. He's the reward. He is the one who brings the reward. In the gospel, he promises you a future that's much better than your little plans for revenge. Okay, God knows what to do, and he will do it, you can be sure. So I'll, I'll leave you, I'll end with a quote here from C.S. Lewis. And again, maybe you've heard it, but to me it's, it's phenomenal. If we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. All right, that's all I have for today. Uh, now, there may be no questions, and if not, great. If there is, uh, Eli, can, any questions about this? I know, it's weird to have questions at the end of a sermon. But I just figured, you know, maybe something I said or something the scripture said made you think about something. So, I may not be able to answer it. I make no promises. Uh, you can answer this one. I feel for you, I, I teach classes where they have children that their parents are attorneys, and it's interesting the questions <laughs> I heard that. Uh, one of the things is sometimes the whiplash of faith and trust in God. And one of the things we're studying in our class is the, uh, the whole history of God and his promises and people not believing mm. God sent prophets and priests and kings until they were taken to captivity. Mm -hmm. And so today we're talking about Ezra. Sorry, yeah, he can't. Okay. Is it on? Yeah, is it on? How's that on? There you go, there you go. <clears throat> I don't have Roger's voice. He was, he, uh, uh, Don was just saying at. there's the whole history of Israel and how God sent to them prophets and priests and, you know, people to speak to them about it. So anyhow, uh, there's the whiplash thing that we kind of studied today a little bit, and, um, and that is when Ezra came, or even when Jeremiah, Jeremiah says, you know, uh, you're going to go to captivity, and when you go there, I want you to build houses, I want you to have families, I want you to support the wicked king of Babylon who's taking you from your home, mm -hmm. and then he says in 70 years, he's going to bring you back. Okay. And the interesting, the whiplash is that a lot of people didn't believe that and wouldn't trust God to mm -hmm. take them from the, from the temple and from their land, but it happened. But a lot of people didn't believe and they stayed and they were punished for that. And those who went there, but there was a promise that 70 years would come back. And one of the questions I think was Hunter asked today, he says, well, in the first Exodus, how many people went? I said, 100%. 100% went. And they, by the mighty hand of God, he overcame Pharaoh. Now, he said, well, how many went in the second exodus? The second exodus is when they left Babylon. And we said about 50,000. How many went in the first one? Over a million. And the thing is, is that God's spirit stirred, stirred his people to go. And they left Babylon, which was a fine place to live after 70 years. Mm -hmm. And they went to a real struggle. But sometimes in life, we get this whiplash. It does, doesn't it make sense. Right. Why would we, why would God do this? And then we're going to go back to that. And even thought Jeremiah was a heretic against the company. 
But God's ways, as always, we have to trust Him and not leave in our own understanding. Yeah, and I think the point you're raising is a good one. I mean, it's, again, it's all throughout the Scripture. And there's the passage in Hebrews, just so, since we're talking about Hebrews, in Hebrews 3, where the author says, encourage one another, one another daily. Not like, you know, uh, once a week. Encourage each other daily as long as it's called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The deceitfulness of sin and not banking on God's promise can come, comes in daily. And so as a community, we have to be people who in, are able to encourage each other whatever way we can to say, no, bank on the promises of God. It's there. Bank on it. Let me remind you about it. They have to be reminded. You're right. The whole history. I mean, Jeremiah, the, the King Zedekiah was totally wicked. He had been completely sold out to sin, wasn't listening to God at all. Jeremiah comes to him. I mean, the whole thing, and, and the Babylonians are coming, and then they're going to just burn the place down. And he, Zedekiah is scared. I can't trust God. I've got to, you know, we've got to figure out a plan here, whatever. And Jeremiah comes to Zedekiah and says, if you obey now, everything will go well with you. After all your wickedness, after all you've done in disregarding God and spitting upon him, if you obey now, it will go well with you. And he didn't listen. He just didn't, he couldn't let go of it. No, that can't be. God, you know, and so it wasn't. And so he tried to run away, and they caught him and gouged, killed his sons all in front of him and gouged his eyes out. So his good and happy future wasn't very good. Okay, but, I mean, Jeremiah still held it out to him. If you just listen now. It's not too late. It's never too late. All right, any, any others? Roger, you don't need the mic. Whatever it was, those people were banking on that Jesus could do something to the point that they were willing to, you know, crack open the roof and put him down in the middle of the, I mean, that, you think about it, you go, it's kind of, I mean, not embarrassing, but you're certainly drawing a lot of attention to yourself. You get up on the roof and open it up and drop a guy down. I mean, uh, but it was worth it. I mean, we can't get in the door. Gosh, we got to get to this guy. We can't get in the door. Let's go through the roof. I mean, they wanted to get to him. And that's so he could be healed of his paralysis. And Jesus gave him something even better. Your sins are forgiven. So, I mean, again, you see, some of this stuff doesn't come till a lot later, uh, after you're dead. Jesus says in one of his parables, he, he's talking about the parable of the banquet, but he says, look, when you give a banquet, don't invite your rich neighbors and friends and family and others because they can repay you. No, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the lame, the blind, because they have nothing with which to repay you. But you will be repaid at the resurrection. God's not saying uh, you get nothing. No, but you have to wait till the resurrection. That could be hard. But it's there. That's, what he, that's the motivation, right? You'll be repaid at the resurrection. Bank on it. All right. Any others? Okay. Thank you for indulging me in that. And let me see. Thank you, and 
Let me pray for us. God, we do want to bank on you. You are the ultimate treasure. We know that we can have you now, today. You offer yourself to us in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit so that we can abide with you and know you now, today. We can have that joy of fellowship and we can have the reward of our inheritance. And so I pray in those specific areas of our money or our work or not taking revenge or having to be patient and wait for something or forgiving somebody, whatever it may be, that we would look to what you've promised and bank on that, Lord, so that we would have power to obey what you're asking us for our own good and for your glory. Amen.